Hello and welcome to the Anatomy and Physiology Midterm Exam Review. Now, this is a video that you're going to want to watch probably a couple of times and definitely take notes because this is the material that is going to be on the midterm exam, specifically the written part. Uh, we'll talk about the bones later on. So we're going to start off talking about something that I hope by now you know. Uh, the liver, of course, is located in the right upper quadrant mostly, but also in the left upper quadrant of the abdominal pelvic cavity. So if you're not sure where the liver is located, it's in the abdominal pelvic cavity, and it is found in the right upper quadrant mostly, but also in the left upper quadrant. Uh, some terminology that we went over, uh, the word prognosis is the predicted outcome of a disease, whereas diagnosis is the identification of the cause of the patient's signs and symptoms. Now, uh, you want to remember dia means complete, because we'll see that one again. And remember G-N-O means no or knowledge. The next thing that you're want, going to want to know is uh, this very simple statement. Cells perform specific functions. This is a true statement. Now, we've talked about uh, there being different types of cells and uh, how they have a very similar machinery. They may even look the same, but they can do very different things. So just remember that cells perform specific functions. In the muscle section, we talked about some muscles of the head and neck region, and I mentioned that the temporalis muscle is one of the three main muscles involved in closing the mouth, along with the medial pterygoid and the masseter. So remember the temporalis and the medial pterygoid and the masseter are the three main muscles involved in closing the mouth. The uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle was another muscle we discussed, it has two places where it begins, has two origins. It starts on the bones of the sternum and the clavicle and inserts on the mastoid process, the sternocleidomastoid muscle. In the bone physiology section, we talked about how bone is a type of tissue called osseous tissue. This is really just another way of saying osseous tissue is bone, bone is osseous tissue. Uh, in the skin section, we talked a little bit about lesions and what a lesion is, and again, this is also in the textbook. Uh, the two that I kind of want you to remember is a freckle, which is a, a lesion called a macule. Now, a macule is a hyperpigmented flattened lesion, so a freckle is a perfect example of that. Another lesion that you're going to want to know about is called a wheel. Now, a wheel is a skin lesion where it is elevated, so it's going to be red around the base, but it's going to have a flat top and often pale on top as well. So this is something you might see with a mosquito bite or hives, for instance. Uh, we talked about the diaphragm. The diaphragm is the muscular structure that separates the abdominal pelvic cavity from the thoracic cavity. This dome-shaped muscle is what is gonna contract, and in the contraction, the flattening of the muscle, it's gonna change the air pressure inside the lungs, causes air to rush in. So remember the diaphragm. In the skin section, we talked about the sebaceous glands and the sudoriferous glands. The sebaceous glands are the glands that secrete sebum. The sebum is oil. So if you remember SEB, sebum is the oil, that's secreted from the sebaceous glands. The sudoriferous glands are the glands that secrete sweat. So remember that they each secrete their own single unique uh, material. They don't do both. In the pathology section of the nervous system, I talked about a rare congenital condition uh, where a child develops without uh, cerebrum or the cranium. This is called anencephaly. It's typically not compatible with life depending upon how much brain is there. So remember that anencephaly. Anencephaly is a condition where the child has no cerebrum, has no brain for the most part. Speaking of the brain, we talked about the different lobes of the brain, the frontal lobe, the parietal bone, the temporal lobe, and the occipital lobe. You remember uh, I said that these different lobes do a lot of different things, but I kind of wanted you to remember the highlights. So if you remember the highlight of the frontal lobe, this is the part of the brain that predicts the benefits and consequences of future actions. That's how I said it kind of predicts the future, what you're going to do. It works out uh, all the benefits of doing something or not doing something. So that is in the frontal lobe. The occipital lobe is where we find the visual cortex. So this is where vision is interpreted. So this is why I said that the occipital lobe is like having eyes in the back of your head to remind you that that's where vision takes place. 
we talked about deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, and we said that the DNA is the recipe and the directions for everything that happens in the body from developmental structures to productions of things like uh, enzymes, proteins. And we said that um, the DNA is going to be found in the nucleus of a cell, which means if you're going to look for DNA, you have to find any cell that has a nucleus because that's where you'll find the DNA. A mature red blood cell, an erythrocyte, does not have a nucleus, therefore it does not have a DNA. That's why it can't make the repairs and has a lifespan of about 120 days. Uh, some more terminology, signs and symptoms. We talked about uh, the signs of a disease. A uh, sign is a recordable or measurable change in a body system, whereas a symptom is a change in the body system that the patient describes to you. So remember not just the definition, but also some examples. For example, a sign of a disease would be something like blood pressure. We can measure that using a sphygmomanometer. Or weight, we can measure that using a scale. A symptom of disease is a change in a body system the patient describes to you. So that would be something like dizziness or uh, pain. Remember, pain cannot be measured. It is a symptom of a disease. In the nervous section, we also talked about specialized cells that help sort of contribute to the uh, neurons, and we said these are neuroglia cells. There was a couple of them that I mentioned specifically. One of those was the astrocytes. I said that astrocytes have radiating branches. Now that reminds me of a star. And astrocytes are also the uh, cell that makes up the blood-brain barrier. So I kind of imagine that as being a star-shaped fence that separates the blood and the brain. It's the astrocytes that make up the blood-brain barrier. I also talked about two other cells, oligodendroglia cells and the Schwann cells. Now, both of these cells do pretty much the same thing. They're both going to make the myelin insulation that wraps around the axon of the neurons. Uh, the difference is really how they do it. It's a little bit different and where they do it. So for this course, how they do it is not as important as where they do it. So the oligodendroglia cells, these are the cells that sort of wrap part of themselves around several different neurons, and they do this in the central nervous system. The Schwann cells wrap their complete self around the axon of the cells in the, in the peripheral nervous system. So to remember the difference, I would say get a note card, write oligodendroglia cell on one side of the note card, and central nervous system, CNS, on the other side. And another note card, I would say write Schwann cell on the one side of the note card and PNS, peripheral nervous system, on the other. So at least you understand where these different cells are going to be found. In the uh, pathology section of the muscle system, we talked about something called gout. Now, gout is the result of uh, the patient's protein recycling system, specifically the purines not being able to go through their recycling correctly. So what happens is the patient ends up with a great deal of uric acid in their joints. And especially um, the textbook example is in the hallux, the big toe. So that's kind of the one I want you to remember. And I think I, I mentioned a patient who had a steak dinner with um, mashed potatoes and gravy, he went to their friend's wine and cheese party, had some good red wine, a lot of nice cheese. And then the next morning they woke up and their hallux, their big toe, was really swollen. And that's gout. I want you to remember it that way. When we talked about the cells, now we went into a lot of detail with the plasma membrane and how it is selectively permeable and allows things to move in and out of the cell and how that will, that will cause a change to occur inside of the cell. When the inside of the cell changes, something's going to happen. Uh, we also talked about the different organelles in the cell, and I said there's a lot of different organelles and they have a lot of different jobs they each do, but I gave you the highlights. So the ones that I want you to remember is, of course, the nucleus. Uh, the nucleus is the brain of the cell. This is where we find the DNA. Uh, we talked about the ribosomes. The ribosomes are the protein-making stations. In other words, uh, just like a gr gas grill, they can make a cheeseburger as long as you bring the meat and the cheese and all the ingredients in order to make it. So they really just sort of put the proteins together, but we'll still count that as protein making. And then we said the endoplasmic reticulum is the protein making factory. Now you'll recall there's two different types. There's the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Well, 
For this class, you really don't need to know the difference. Uh, the, end, the rough endoplasmic reticulum is the one that makes the proteins, the smooth is the one that makes the fats, but we're not gonna worry about that. If just for right now, you remember that the endoplasmic reticulum makes proteins, the ribosomes make proteins, uh, that will help you greatly. We said that the Golgi apparatus or the Golgi body, this is what I often refer to as the pack and ship. This is what puts everything together and puts the finishing touches on and gets it ready for shipping. The lysosome is a transport vehicle within the cell. Now, I want you to think of the lysosome as these little bags of digestive enzymes because they're gonna carry these enzymes that are gonna destroy bacteria or uh, possibly even broken down cell parts. So think of the lysosomes that way. And then we talked about the mitochondria. Now the mitochondria are the um, energy making factories in the cell. They're the ones that make the, the ATP, the adenosine triphosphate. So remember the mitochondria, these are the powerhouses of the cell. Going back to muscle physiology. In muscle physiology, we talked about how the signal comes down a neuron as an electrical current. As it reaches the end of the neuron, it activates calcium channels, calcium comes in. That then causes the release of acetylcholine. Now acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that's going to go across the junction. It is going to bind to the receptors onto the muscle fiber, which is going to allow sodium to come in, depolarizing the cell. That causes the release of intracellular calcium, which causes the sliding filament theory, which is gonna cause the contraction of the cell. What I want you to remember is that neurotransmitter. I want you to remember the acetylcholine. Uh, that is the one that is released from the neuron, goes across the neuromuscular junction, binds to the receptors of the cell. Uh, we probably remember the uh, cholinesterase. He's sort of the recycling guy, comes in and cleans up uh, the mess, brings it back into the, into the neuron. For right now, acetylcholine, he is the neurotransmitter I want you to remember. Uh, I spent some time talking about osmosis. Hopefully by now you understand the importance of osmosis, the importance this property of water has moving uh, passively as it does. But uh, for this test, please remember the definition of osmosis. Osmosis is the passive movement of water across a selectively permeable membrane from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. You definitely want to remember that. In the nervous system, we talked about uh, the transmission of signal from neuron to neuron, and we said that that electrical signal changed into a chemical, which changes back into an electrical signal, has to go across that junction. That junction where two neurons meet is what we're gonna call the synapse. Now, the synapse, uh, as I want you to know it, is going to include the presynaptic neuron, in other words, where the signal's coming from, as well as the space, and then the postsynaptic neuron, meaning the dendrites and the receptors of the next neuron. The space in between is called the synaptic gap or the synaptic cleft or the synaptic space or sometimes just the synapse. Uh, so for this class, I kind of want you to remember that it includes the neurons as well or parts of the neurons as well. Um, then there was something we talked about early on and it is kind of important to remember that when a lot of the medical terminology was created, it wasn't created to be difficult. And this was the example that I'd given you. The occipital bone is the bone that is in the back and also makes up a great deal of the floor of the cranium. It has a large hole in it. That large hole is called the foramen magnum. The foramen magnum is the large hole in the base of the cranium where the spinal cord meets the brain stem, which meets the brain. And it literally means the big hole. Uh, a couple of prefixes that I want you to remember. Prefix pre means before or in front of. Uh, the prefix post means after or behind. And then, uh, there was one that I said is the most important prefix that you'll know, uh, and that is dys, D-Y-S. Dys means difficult, painful, or abnormal. And I said this is one of the most important uh, prefixes that you'll need to know because pretty much everything in the body at some point can become difficult or it can become painful or it can become ab abnormal. So you'll definitely want to remember dys. Uh, going back to muscle movement, we talked about uh, flexion and extension and specifically dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. I said this pertains to the foot. So dorsiflexion of the foot causes the toes to point upward. Plantar flexion causes the toes to point downward towards the plants. Dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. Speaking of which, when we talked about the muscles, we said the 
calf muscle, it's actually made up of two muscles, but the one that I, I wanted you to remember is called the gastrocnemius muscle. Don't con get confused. Just because you see gastro, you might think that means stomach. Well, gastroc also means stomach. And the confusing part, of course, is that this has nothing to do with the stomach. This is actually a muscle of the calf. But it is the gastrocnemius muscle, that is the calf muscle, that plantar flexes the foot and causes you to lift up onto your tippy toes. Remember, it is that tendon that goes all the way down to the calcaneus bone, which is what is often referred to as Achilles tendon that attaches, that causes the foot to plantar flex. We talked about the muscles of the leg, um, the quadricep muscles, and I said uh, you don't necessarily need to know the individual muscles. Now, eventually you will need to know about the vastus lateralis muscle, but right now it's not as important. Uh, same with the hamstring muscles. You can just call those the hamstrings right now. We talked about the pectoralis muscles, the big chest muscles, uh, the deltoid muscles, very important muscle in moving the arm up and away from the body, but it's also where we give injections. The trapezius muscle, this is the muscles that shrug the shoulders. Uh, and then of course, one of my favorite muscles, the intercostal muscles, which are absolutely delicious if you slow cook them and cover them in barbecue sauce. That is a true statement. Uh, in the hand, we said that these muscles right here are the thenar muscles. The thenar muscles are the muscles associated with the thumb right here. These are the hypothenars, but right now we want to know about the thenar muscles. So when you think of the thenar muscles, think of your thumb. When you think of thenar muscles, think of thumb. Thenar, think thumb. Uh, we talked about the bicep brachii, the tricep brachii as well. And of course, we went into the abdominal muscles, but uh, you can go through those. I think you remember the important ones I sort of stressed in class. A couple of things finally with the bone again. Um, osteomas and osteosarcomas. These are tumors of the bone. Remember I said if it's an oma versus a sarcoma, it's usually benign versus malignant. So an, osteo an osteoma is a benign tumor of the bone, whereas an osteosarcoma is a malignant tumor of the bone. And then as well with the bone cells, the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. The osteoblasts are the cells that are going to build up a new bone. They're going to deposit new bone in areas, whereas the osteoclasts are going to collapse the old bone. They're going to break it down. I like to say collapse because it begins with a C. Osteoclasts collapse. Osteoblasts build up. So I hope that helps. Now, uh, again, please make sure you take notes as you're going through this. Review this material over and over. Watch the videos as many times as you can.